I think though that as we've just hit 10.30, uh, I'll get going. So first of all, a very warm welcome today. Uh, you're here, you're joining us, Sums Consulting, uh, to learn more about ensuring your university is fit for the future. And I'll be joined by my colleagues today, uh, Managing Group Director Joel Arbor, Principal Consult Consultant Full Iqbahai, and Managing Consultant David Becker. And we're going to be talking about the wide range of areas that SUMS has expertise in to support universities in their efficiency and effectiveness and a lot of other different areas. Um, but before I go into too much detail there, I just want to go through a few housekeeping items with you. So I'm sure everyone's very familiar with Zoom webinar mode, but we are now there. So you are notice that your uh, audio and your video has been turned off for now. You can exit the full screen mode and that will allow you to split your screen, which is often a bit better for viewing. So you can make your slides bigger or smaller as you need. Uh, the session's also being recorded. In case you miss anything today, there will be a recorded version. And you'll see at the bottom of your screen, for me, it's towards the right-hand side, a closed captioning button. So uh, you can either enable or disable that uh, by clicking on that button and either showing or hiding subtitles. If anyone's having any problems with those, just give me a shout. Uh, lots of ways to get involved with us um, today. Obviously, please do use the chat and the Q&A. We'll also have a poll. Uh, and then please do engage with us and, and follow us on LinkedIn and Twitter. We often share um, you know, our insights, our thought, thought pieces and briefing papers, uh, which you would all get emailed as members as well. But it's a nice way to kind of have some, some uh, conversation outside of traditional email. Uh, so we wanted to kick things off with a little bit of, uh, you know, a discussion as, as we would try and have in a normal meeting, a normal session that we're holding. So really interested to hear whether this is personally or professionally, what you're most looking forward to as a result of lockdown being eased. So I know uh, I did a quick sort of uh, query of my colleagues and um, going to, you know, coffee with friends, uh, vacations, um, pubs, absolutely. Um, interesting point on the vacations though. One person was looking forward to doing it in about, you know, four months time once that initial rush cleared off. Uh, seeing family in Guernsey, yeah, absolutely. All that kind of stuff. So, you know, I think, I think lots of us are really need this kind of opening up of things. So it's really nice that we're being able to do that and that's aligning with the, with the warm weather. Um, so fabulous. So I want to bring in Joel now here. Uh, Joel is our group managing director uh, to tell you a bit more about SUMS, who we are and what we do, and then I will pop back up later to help with the Q&A. So over to you, Joel. Thanks, Marianne, and good morning, everybody. Welcome to the session. Um, Today is really about uh, helping existing clients and members understand a little bit more about SUMS and um, introducing ourselves to, to, uh, to those that don't know us so well. So let's start with the basics. SUMS is a not-for-profit specialist higher education consultancy. We work for universities and are owned by universities. SUMS Consulting is part of the SUMS Group, whose collective reach extends beyond 50% of the UK higher education sector. We're a membership organisation dedicated to sharing best practice for the benefit of the sector. Our consulting members include a wide range of teaching focused institutions, as well as some of the most renowned research intensive universities in the world. SUMS understands universities and works across all areas of professional support, strategy and change. Our in-depth knowledge of universities sets us apart from other consultancies. We know how to engage positively with academic areas and bring together their needs with those of professional services. And we understand how all areas of a university must work together and be strategically aligned if the institution is to deliver on its strategic goals and enhance the student experience and research. We've been helping our university members and clients to solve complex problems for the past 50 years. Our core team of consultants combines commercial sector and big four consultancy experience with HE leadership experience. We describe ourselves as objective insiders, offering the perspective and validation of external eyes with a deep understanding of the unique political and governance landscapes inside universities. And we complement our core team with a wide range of associate consultants, helping both to increase our capacity as and when our members and clients need, or to deploy subject matter specialists. We've currently got 50 professional consultants in our associate base. Here's just a few of them. It's more than a year now since the higher education sector in the UK, along with the rest of the country, went into lockdown as a consequence of COVID. 
And as we stand at the end of March, we've just passed one landmark on the government roadmap out of lockdown, that path to freedom and normality. But the reality is that universities shouldn't even try to get back to normal. COVID may be a natural disaster, but it also presents an opportunity to reshape HE for the future. In the work SUMS did last summer with HE leaders, we identified three main opportunities for change driven by the pandemic. Embracing the financial challenges to transform structures, systems and processes. Capitalizing on the digital transformation opportunity to reshape physical spaces. And taking a less rigid approach to the academic calendar and creating multiple start dates to facilitate more flexible customer centric provision. And we're already seeing good evidence across our network of universities that these trends are active and gathering momentum. The first two in particular have driven much of SUM's work over the past year. Our service offer and experience is extensive, spanning the breadth of higher education operations. Today, we're gonna to give you just a flavor of the kind of work we've been focusing on over the past year and share with you the trends that we're seeing among our members and clients across the sector. Let's start with teaching and learning, which remains at the heart of every university. SUMS provision in this area covers many aspects from portfolio review to processes and governance relating to curriculum renewal, to development of pedagogy and assessment, as well as many of the enablers, such as timetabling, space management, workload modeling. SUMS supports universities by seeking to understand their unique culture and strategy and how this applies to teaching, learning and assessment. COVID has accelerated consideration of different ways of doing things, from delivery of lectures to adoption of different forms of assessment. SUMS has particular interest in supporting institutions to diversify their delivery, whether this is in relation to the types of learner, the mode of delivery, or the structure of curricula. We're supporting several institutions with work relating to the growth of apprenticeships, for instance. We've seen starkly over the last year that the world of teaching and learning is changing. Traditional undergraduate students, 18 to 22 year olds, are likely still going to want to physically go to university and have that campus experience. But the campus experience will be enhanced by technology. They almost certainly won't sit in a traditional lecture theater, 400 students listening to a lecture. They might listen to that lecture on demand on their phone. The time they spend with the academic staff will be more interactive in its nature. So more discussion, more seminars, more tutorials. A postgraduate level, students may be returning to study a professional subject. They might be in their 30s or 40s wanting to retrain, and they won't necessarily want to go to campus. They've got families, they've got busy lives. There's an opportunity here to expand postgraduate education with fully online delivery. And there's a very new opportunity for short, continuing higher education courses, courses which are delivered at a high level, but far shorter, more flexible courses, which students can combine in different ways, following their own interests and requirements. Some of these courses may be highly tailored to the needs of an employer or a professional body. And COVID has fast forwarded us to a future of hybrid, flexible teaching and learning. But academic staff can struggle with the changes that they need to make to teach effectively online. Teaching isn't a stand-up routine or a theatrical performance. Yes, you need high quality audio and video, a bit like making a film, but it's more difficult than that as it's interactive. So it's not just about becoming comfortable with the technology. It's about learning a new pedagogy, new teaching practices. But the underlying principles of good teaching and assessment still apply and are paramount. Academic lecturing is traditionally a solo activity, but for high quality digital education, it's quite common for an audiovisual expert or a learning technologist to co-produce material with an academic subject expert. So teaching becomes something more of a team sport. It presents challenges for students too. In the digital world, some of the scaffolding that supported students has been removed. In the old world, driven by an academic timetable, students would move from lecture theater to lab. If you turn up where you need to be, follow the instructions, do as you're told, that might be enough to get by. But the best digital learning is active, is interactive. Students need to take responsibility for their own learning. The inputs are less important than the outputs. There's more by way of group discussion, more learning from your peers to be done. 
high flex learning and teaching offers a real opportunity for universities to expand. But for success, we need to acknowledge that learning is a social co-production activity where community is essential and the next big challenge for the sector. Timetabling and space management are key areas of focus for SUMS and differentiate us from the larger consultancies. The challenges of timetable and space management are different for each institution, depending on strategy and the balance of priorities between staff, students, space and curriculum. Since the COVID pandemic hit, timetablers and space managers have been in reactive mode, considering changes to government policies around social distancing and ventilation fitting remaining face-to-face -face activities into appropriate spaces. Going forwards, the challenge for timetabling will be in enabling that high flex approach to both pedagogy and service delivery. Some institutions will be facing significant financial challenges and may be looking to their space managers to reduce the footprint in order to reduce recurrent costs of space or to enable divestiture or capital income growth. We're very much seeing how COVID has been a disruptor in this, pushing the sector to be more agile and flexible in its approach. Timetabling is that process that links staff, time, space, curriculum and students. We're seeing a number of institutions address complexity in curricula to reduce overheads, improve student experience and ease timetabling demands. At a macro level, some institutions will try and reduce their footprints. At a micro level, we're likely to see an increase in a couple of things. In the short term, investment in flexible spaces to support teaching and learning activities. In the longer term, investment in specialist academic space as an institution's USP to actually bring people onto campus. But I think we need to get our heads around the reality that university is not just about place. SUMS has been doing quite a lot of work over the past six months, supporting universities as they consult with staff about future ways of working, not just going back to doing things how they were before the pandemic. People are asking for flexibility. The closure of campuses and moving to online learning services and support has ta taught us really that more flexible working, remote working is not only possible, in many cases, it's desired by staff and students alike. But we need to remember in this that we have diverse work workforces and needs. Listening to and understanding these needs will help you find a way in which flexible working can best meet those needs while still delivering the same outcomes. For some, that means working on campus full time. For others, from home. And for most, a mix of the two. We need to remember that work is something you do rather than somewhere you go. So the key is to enable colleagues to be both productive and collaborative. In particular, seek to create ways of working which support staff to be hyper collaborative when they're on campus and hyper productive when they're working from home. While space, time, equipment needs vary by role and culture by institution, look to agree a common set of principles along with some practical ground rules as a starting point for co-designing ways of working with your staff. The benefits of getting this right could well be higher job satisfaction, better work-life balance, improved mental health, things that we all can agree are important. The final area that I'm going to speak to today before handing over to colleagues is marketing and student recruitment. It's my own area of professional expertise, and we have seen a significant spike in interest in this field over the past year. Some of this work has been around identity and brand, as institutions look to communicate their distinctiveness in a consistent way. We've carried out a number of assignments to redefine or hone value propositions, informed by external perceptions and co-created by staff and students. But the majority of the work that we've done has been focused on student recruitment and in particular on improving conversion. While many universities are seeking to make efficiencies, a significant number are actively making strides to increase their income from student recruitment. We've undertaken a range of process reviews looking at the whole pre-enrollment journey or indeed specific parts of that journey, notably with admissions teams. Universities are looking to add greater sophistication to their marketing and lead nurturing, aided by automation, AI, and the professionalization of communications throughout the journey. Marketing teams are increasingly looking to data 
to help them make better informed decisions and make effective marketing interventions with more timely, relevant communications when the audience need them on their conversion journey. And now is the time for universities to drive, to drive greater efficiency in this area, to embrace and invest in the digital revolution in marketing, to shake up outmoded approaches. Why? Because the demographic trajectory points to an additional 50,000 UK students a year by 2030. Similarly, a major study by Holon IQ points to an increase from 5 million to 7 million international students globally in that same time frame. So now is the time to make sure that processes, systems, people are up to the challenge, ready to meet the demands of Gen Z and the then Generation A. Their expectation levels are of a different order. By acting now, universities can get themselves ready to take advantage of these coming opportunities. So yes, the good times are coming again, but only those pragmatic enough to change the way they do things will be able to take full advantage. Interesting times. Thanks very much, Joel. And I think you've, you've talked a lot about some of the very real challenges coming down the pipeline, but also lots of reasons to be optimistic. So There's a we- Huge amount of optimism out there. Yeah, and is that is this resonating for folks? So feel free to, you know, again, drop us a line in the chat. But we wanted to launch a quick poll just to see on a scale of one to 10, which, you know, maybe you're, you're number one, not feeling optimistic at all about things uh, versus feeling, you know, really gung ho. Where, where is everybody sitting right now? Oh, this is pretty reassuring. So um, I'm just watching some answers come in. And, you know, everybody has put themselves above a five in terms of how they're, how they're feeling about the challenges ahead. Yeah, about an eight, yeah. And I wonder if there's something that you want to add into the chat there about why that is. Are you feeling quite supported with the structures, with the systems? Um, you know, is your, your institution really adopted the appropriate strategy quickly? Um, excellent, yeah, so we'll, we'll wrap that up and share the results then. But it looks like, yes, most people have, have put that they're feeling in around a, a seven and eight. So that's really reassuring. Nice way to, to start the, the weekend, I think. So with that, uh, I'll hand over to my colleague, uh, Principal Consultant Fola Ikbahai, who will take you through the work that we're doing in change and transformation. So over to you, Fola. Thanks, Marian. And a nice way to start my bit to see that lots of people are on an eight as well, seven, eights and nines, all good. Um, so for my section, then I'm going to be focusing in on change and transformation. And now, um, even though I say uh, change and transformation, as you can see on this slide, change covers a multitude of areas. When I say that I'm a change specialist, I can go into universities and as you can see on the left-hand side, work in a range of areas. And just before I go into the detail of this, actually, I've seen that there are quite a few people that are on the call today who are parts of our change community of practice. I have to say, coming back to Joel's point around silver linings. One of the things that I have looked forward to during this pandemic and this lockdown is every second Monday of the month when I catch up with members of the change community. We meet online and we've been doing so now for coming up to a year, I think. And uh, so Debbie Felicity, I know you're on the call. Serena, I think I've seen you as well. So a few members of our change community are here today. Um, we also have a WhatsApp group, which we've just started and that's going strong as as well. So yeah, Felicity has said hi. Um, any other members of the change community, just feel free to say hi as well. And if you haven't joined us, and if you have change in your title, and I've seen quite a few of you on the list, make sure that you contact me or contact the SUMS office so that we can all link you up. Um, but just coming in from there then, just emphasizing the fact that I am not going to be focusing on change principles today because change is a means to an end and not an end in itself. So what I really want to do today is just to give you a flavor of some of the projects that I've been involved in um, from a change perspective. Um, and I'm going to do that actually after this, this is, this is the final point that I'm going to focus in on around change principles and approach 
approach. And the reason why I've focused in on this slide here that you can see is I've just mentioned the change community of practice. And when I started working with this community, we immediately started to identify a number of barriers to change in the sector. And it is based on the work of this community of practice that I pulled together uh, sums change maturity matrix, which I now use when I go into any university and I'm involved in a change program, just to test, you know, their planning, their implementation and their embedding of change programs and just to see how mature they are. So that maturity matrix is available to all our members. Um, there's a link on their sums um, email if you're interested in that. And somebody has already asked for more information on the change community of practice that will be whizzing its way through to you. We'll take names of after this. So thanks for that. But the maturity matrix, if I just end on this point, I'm not going to go into it in detail, is all about recognizing the fact that every university is different in terms of the way it handles change, but there are some key principles that we should all adopt. So that change maturity matrix, as it says there on the screen, is very much about the what needs to happen rather than the how it needs to happen and prescribing that. So um, yeah, just um, feel Feel free to contact, her, contact us if you'd like to see that. I'm now going to do a little bit of a, I mean, it's too much to say it's a deep dive because it's not, there's not enough time in, in this slot, but I'm just going to focus in on about three areas where I think are, are quite topical at the moment. Um, so the first one is research and enterprise, which is one of our specialist areas that Joel mentioned earlier. Then I'm going to be talking about student journey and a little bit about um, mental health and well-being. And Felicity, feel free to wax lyrical in the chat when I get to mental health and well-being because I know that that is one of your subject areas that you like to talk about. Um, but research and enterprise then, we've done a lot of work and I don't know how many of you on the call have been involved in completing the REF over the last couple of months. If you have, you know, say hi and thank goodness you're still alive. Um, I've been to quite running quite a few workshops over the last couple of months um, around around student journey, strategy development, and every time somebody's come in from the research and enterprise kind of area of the world, they've always been, oh my goodness, thank goodness that that's over. And now in the research and enterprise space, there is now a new um, thing um, on the horizon, which is the knowledge exchange concordat. Don't know whether anyone on the call has heard about that or is working on that at the moment. I'm currently doing some work with Surrey, actually. Hi, Colin, I know you're there, around their preparation to complete their knowledge exchange concordat um, self-evaluation. And it's really interesting, as I've been doing my travels, just understanding how people define knowledge exchange within their universities. But one thing that is really relevant across the board, irrespective of the university that I've spoken to, is the importance of research institutes and research centres. So that reminded me of a piece of work that I did with Bristol just, just at the end of last year, thinking about their research institutes and you know, the organisation around that, shaping the research vision, understanding how to ensure that they get a re return on investment from their research institutes. Once again, I'm not sure whether there's anyone um, on the call today who's been involved in anything to do with research and enterprise um, within your universities. If so, you know, mention it in the chat. Um, but some of the things that came up out of that review, which I thought are, are relevant, irrespective of whether you're doing a deep dive into research and enterprise or not, is that first bullet point around applied, and there should be another word in there, collaborative research. That is the important thing at the moment. So in my day, and we're talking about, you know, in another lifetime, when I was doing research, it was okay to do re research just for the sake of it. You know, I want to know this and I'm going to to do this and I'm you know going to stay up all night carrying out this experiment. Now it's very much about making sure that the research is of real world impact and so once again 
one of the things that um, I did on the back of this particular um, assignment was to put a questionnaire together around our research institutes, a self-evaluation questionnaire to say how much are your research institutes really, really focusing on real world impact? And I think the um, second to the last bullet point there around closure of institutes where appropriate, that was a big thing that Bristol were kind of looking to explore that we, when you sometimes, and everybody who's undertaken a project will be aware of this, um, it's easy, it's really easy to start a project, but closing it down sometimes is a little bit difficult, even if you know, you know, that it is no, it's no longer fit for purpose or, or yielding a good return. So that was one um, area of benchmarking that I did. And I found out across the board, across the UK, there are only a few universities who actually have a clear method for reviewing their research institutes, analyzing whether they're still fit for purpose, and where appropriate, either consolidating, say putting, you know, two research institutes into one or taking that massive decision to close because it is no more in line with strategic objectives or, you know, ethical considerations and things like that. Because things move on, research moves on, research is about the future. So I, I could wax lyrical about research and enterprise, but I think I'll move on now. And these are just some of the key learnings that we got um, from that piece of work that we did. Student journey and student voice. Um, I think Joel has already touched on, on this a little bit when he talked about student recruitment and marketing. We've done an awful lot of work around the student voice. And I, I remember once again, you can see there's, there's a theme emerging here about maturity matrices. I, I think I, I just like that kind of element of standardization in, in this mad world. So um, when I did this piece of work, I think this was with the Open University a while ago. On the back of that work, we pulled together a student voice maturity matrix. I didn't put the email address on this slide, but it goes without saying, you know, if you want to hear more about that, then uh, just let me know. Um, what is Alex saying in the chat? Um, recently doing some work on this at, oh, I think this was about research. Yeah, okay, yeah, well done, Alex. So uh, like I said, you're still there, you're still you're still alive and, and kicking around REF. I think either that was REF or that was knowledge exchange, one of the two. Um, so thank you for that. So yes, so student journey, student voice, lots of focus in, on this area at the moment. And personally, I've been doing a whole range of process review workshops around admissions, enrollment, uh, fees and funding, um, all of that, just, just looking at the student life and the, and the student journey. But the piece of work that I actually want to describe to you today is actually, this actually isn't my work. So I just want to give a, you know, thumbs up to my colleague Claire Taylor, who's done an awful lot of work around apprenticeships. And she's been looking at apprenticeships from the point of view of the student experience or the experience of an apprentice, I'm sure you'll all agree, is very different from the standard undergraduate or postgraduate student. So she's been looking at this from the point of view of compliance and looking also at how do you become a the preferred supplier. So very much around retention, progression, quality, building up your expertise in that area so that apprentices will want to come to your um, institution because apprenticeships are a big market. And then the last point in this little nest here is around best practice loops. And this is an interesting consideration. This is around looking at that complex apprentice journey and thinking, how can we take some of that best practice from that complex area and feed that into a standard undergraduate student grading? If we've cracked it for apprenticeship, apprentices, then definitely, you know, we can crack it for the undergraduate and postgraduate. So that is just something that, that, that um, came up in a study that Claire carried out. I think that was with UWE at the end of last year. 
And this is what she created on the back of that piece of work. And once again, I would kind of urge you to, to get in touch if you're interested in anything to do with apprenticeships or indeed the student journey itself. So what Claire did on the back of that piece is she created an apprentice life cycle tool that is literally just the start of the tool. Anytime, I mean, I live in London. I don't know how many other people live in London, but anytime I look at this, it reminds me of the tube map, which um, I'm sure you all come down to London. But um, Claire has created this piece. And it's a really comprehensive tool that looks at all of the key milestones, the tasks, the key decisions, all of the risks around the apprentice journey. And she's kind of put some descriptors against them so that this can be customized for any institution. I know somebody from the change community has already asked for this tool and been given it by Claire and they found it really useful. So like I said, if you're involved in the chat, just let me know. If you're involved in um, apprentices, uh, apprenticeships or apprentice life cycle work. Um, don't reinvent the wheel. Um, this, is, this is a good piece here. Okay, now Felicity, this is where I said you should start waxing lyrical in the chat, girl. Um, so <laughs> mental health and well-being services. This is actually another um, piece of work that is, is actually not mine. This, this piece of work was done by my colleagues Jeanette Strachan and Helen Baird. There are specialists in relation to mental health and well-being, and they've done an awful lot of work around assessing institutions against the step change framework. Um, Felicity that I mentioned, who I think is doing a little bit of chatting in there, she wrote a paper last year. Uh, what was it called? It was I think it was something around working through COVID, and it was talking about health, well-being, and enablement. That is still on our website. Site. I'm sure if you if you Google that 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 that'll come up, um, and that that was a really good piece that Felicity did the survey in the sector, looking at you know the different approaches to enablement for then home working as a result of the pandemic, and just the health and well-being concerns around that. But there's a lot of work, like I said, that's going on, and I think coming all the way back to what Joel mentioned in the beginning around silver linings. I think one silver lining from from the, the pandemic is the heightened priority that's now been given to mental health and well-being. I'm sure that you all agree. I mean, it went whether, whether it's to do with staff mental health and well-being, students' mental health and well-being, the priority has really, you know, skyrocketed since the beginning of the pandemic. And I think that that can only be good. And the step change framework that is referenced here that Jeanette and Helen are working on, that is all about giving this holistic approach to mental health and well-being, both for staff and for students um, within the, the sector. So a few bits of learning from this then that um, Jeanette and um, Helen have come up with. Just a few bullet points here. So very much around the focus. Thanks, Felicity. I think Felicity has just put something in the chat. Yeah, that's about the paper that I just referred to. So um, yeah, that, that's there for everybody. Just click that link. Um, that, that's a really good paper. Um, but the point here, the first point on this slide is around that whole university approach to supporting staff and student mental health and well-being and I think that's critical because you know before like before the pandemic I mean if it was staff mental health and well-being then hey you know chuck that at HR if it was student mental health and well-being you know student support and well-being services but what step change framework and what studies are showing is that this is about a whole university approach and I think that that is going to continue even long after the pandemic so once again silver linings a really good direction of travel in relation to mental health and well-being. And the other bullet point I probably want to touch on a little bit is about the increased focus on uh, transitions, prevention and early intervention. 
and this actually goes all the way back to um, something that uh, around the student journey because in the student journey this comes up a lot about the you know the transitions from level four to level five in some universities you reduce the level of support to students during that time and how do you manage their mental health and well-being as you're you know reducing their reliance on academic coaches and mentors and things like that so very much a focus around those transition points what has Felicity said in the chat yeah also supply coaching and mentoring services to SAMS members once again all linked in with the mental uh, health and well-being and beyond management support framework there um, the third bullet point here is around working with the NHS and partners. Once again, really focused on that holistic approach to mental health and well-being. And the final point there is really just focused on understanding that early intervention, getting getting things in quick to address um, any issues around mental health and well-being before they escalate. So, Fola can now take a breath. That was a really quick whistle-stop tour through a number of areas. As you can appreciate, I didn't go into a deep dive on any of those, but really if you've heard anything that you're really interested in hearing a little bit more about i know i've seen a, a few things in the chat already you know just get in touch with the sums office and we'll be able to you know set up a chat or, or send you some information so I started off this uh, little, my little segment by saying that, you know, change and transformation is not an end in itself. It's a means to an end. And that's why I didn't focus too much on the change principles. Another element of work that we do, which is also a means to an end, is around target operating model work and operational design. And our resident specialist for that has just come on screen. So I'm going to log off now and uh, David over to you. Thanks very much Fola and a very good morning from me to all of you on the call today. I spent around 20 years helping organisations with the two things you can see hopefully very shortly on this slide that is organisation design and efficiencies and although these are two different specialisms they are much more closely related than a lot of people realise and the reason for that is that the design and the soft architecture of universities can be extraordinarily complex you all know it um, and a complex environment is one where inefficiencies can hide and they can thrive. So if we take a step back and we think about it a little bit, universities tend to have multiple layers of hierarchy, huge volume of systems, and even the product offer itself is complex in most instances with large portfolios of courses, some of which are run at very high cost with relatively low attendance, um, but nearly all of which are quite difficult to stand down, even in instances when the metrics suggest that they should be. So when you take that internal context and you add to it everything that's going on in the external environment at the moment it's probably no surprise that organization design and efficiencies are two of the areas where some has been very heavily engaged in recent times and what i want to quickly fly you through today is a couple of examples of how we've been helping so projects which are letting some universities now address uh, the very large question uh, which you can see on the slide here so in the blue box on the left hand side of the screen I've made reference to some of our recent assignments and you'll see pretty quickly that a lot of these are related in some way to either organisation design or efficiencies and sometimes both. And if an end goal for a university is outstanding design within a highly efficient operating model it can be instructive as a starting point I think to examine what bad design looks like and bad design manifests itself in universities in different ways specifically within the context of the projects referenced on this slide that bad design manifested itself in the form of competing priorities um, areas of provision where a university had invested a serious sum of money but which wasn't delivering any notable return on investment in terms of student recruitment or staff or student satisfaction or progress up the league tables there were a lot of times when staff felt strangled by excessive administration or bureaucracy. A really interesting area of work around the sheer volume of committees and meetings with overlapping agendas and attendees. Um, and often we saw quite high levels of conflict or tension between stakeholders in different parts of the institution too. And 
many of those problems had their roots in some form of organization design deficits. And that was interesting for a couple of reasons, but, but partly because the recent landscape at those universities wasn't one where universities hadn't been trying to tackle the problem previously. The, the recent landscape was actually scattered with big change or efficiency projects that in the end probably hadn't delivered as much as people might have wished they had done. Uh, or more commonly, they delivered some benefit early on, but over the course of several months, the changes just hadn't been sustainable. And the university was finding that costs and non-compliance with new ways of working had simply risen again. So if I was to try and distill this down a bit further, I'd point out two things. Firstly, a really common problem we observe is that when you try to make efficiencies without changing your organisation design, in most instances, you're often only tackling the symptom and not the cause. There is one outlier to that in the form of procurement efficiencies, which I'll talk to very shortly. Um, but secondly, there are, there are loads of people in universities, entire departments within universities, who totally get what good organisation design looks like. People who are great corporate citizens, they've got a good understanding of service design and process excellence, and for all those reasons, have themselves initiated department level improvements. But what you then sometimes get is a different problem rearing its head, which is that the interdependencies and the handoffs between university departments are so significant that even the very best departments can't truly thrive unless the rest of the organisation is moving in that same direction too. So let me drill a little bit more into some of this. I mentioned procurement. Um, I want to tell you very briefly how our procurement value assessment can play a role in helping your institution be fit for the future. And happily for me, we do have at least two of our experts in the field of procurement and contract management on the call today in the form of Linda and Graham. So hello to both of you and um, please do throw your thoughts into the chat um, if you wish as I go through this. Uh, the reason I've chosen to dwell a little bit on procurement is because it helps universities make efficiency savings, which are sometimes independent of staffing costs or structures. And that means straight away that you can pursue those efficiencies more aggressively because you're avoiding the political challenges that come with any proposals to reduce staffing. The second reason is that it's a massive opportunity. So the International Association of Commercial and Contract Management suggests that the average organisation, the average organisation, suffers a loss of more than 9% of their spend through poor process. If I flip that and think about it from a pure procurement point of view with the work SUMS has done, the average savings we've identified per institution actually exceeds £2 million. So quick run through how it works. It's a real mix of detailed, granular, quantitative analysis with meaningful staff engagement. So we take all of the unique data sets available to us at SUMS and bear in mind we're part of the SUMS group so that does include the largest purchasing consortium in HE in the UK and we use that data as a context for a deep dive into your particular university's purchase ledger data. From there, we can analyse and benchmark your spend at category and subcategory levels to identify all the potential improvements through aggregation, rationalisation, better compliance. And then we can pull together an opportunity assessment in quite a detailed format uh, by considering your spend data against critical benefit levers, looking at demand, supply, total cost. Crucial to look beyond the numbers with this stuff. So by speaking with staff uh, in procurement, in finance, of course, but also budget holders across professional services and in academic areas to really get a granular view of your institutional approach to procurement, looking at people, processes and systems. And I should point out, we've got, I think, probably more than a decade, or at least a decade of delivering the procurement maturity assessment across the SECs now. So all of this input combines together and lets us develop a savings delivery plan for universities with a particular emphasis on that being realistic and actionable. Um, because it's one thing to highlight the savings available, but quite another thing to actually uh, bring them to life in the first place. One other thing to note, I think here, there's been loads of work done by both the SUMS group and indeed the commercial consultancies in this area. And the last data I saw less than two months ago suggested that procurement accounts for around 30% of realised savings in universities. And that is typically more than any other function. So it's not an area to neglect. Um, so in conclusion, if you need to make efficiencies, but you're not yet in a place where you can truly focus on organisation design, then the procurement value assessment is a great place to start. Back to organisation design then, 
this for me is the area where universities are going to have to really get it right in the years ahead if they want to stay ahead of the game. So good organisation design pulls together and aligns the contribution of all of your people, your processes, your systems in a way that Yes, it reduces waste, um, but fundamentally it can accelerate your journey from where you are now as an institution to the target state, which is probably set out in your strategy. And it's worth reflecting that there is no high performance organisation in any sector that I know of which neglects good design. Local government is a great example of it. We've probably got people on the call today who've spent some time in local authorities. It's a sector which has lost billions and billions of pounds since 2010. And yet the way, we, uh, the way we interact with local authorities today is unrecognisable from uh, that time 10 years ago. And irrespective of the political decisions which have brought us to that point, local authorities had no choice but to do more with less. And the satisfaction ratings across that sector today, I think, are actually slightly higher on average than they were. So I want to tell you a little bit about how the work SUMS has been doing in this area prioritises the absolute criticality of insight-led decision-making and why, if you take nothing else from today, this is what you need to get right if you're going to have to, uh, if you're going to have a chance of making meaningful and sustainable change. So what do we see here? Um, Every university, more or less, has to submit a statutory staffing return to HESA every year, the Higher Education Statistics Agency. And what you can see on this slide currently is what the staffing trend looks like at a sector-wide level over a five-year period. So I think I've gone from 2014-15 on this one. And it all looks fairly stable. So you can see there's been a slight decline overall in the numbers of admin and secretarial staff or the proportion of admin and secretarial staff. And that's absolutely to be expected because the sector's got a bit better at automating high volume processes, reducing administrative burden. Professional occupations have risen a little bit. Again, probably reflects the increasing professionalization standards we've seen in areas, including finance, HR and marketing. It was much more common for me seven or eight years ago to go into a university and see finance and marketing staff scattered all over an institution rather than within one professional service. So this is all interesting, but it gets more interesting when you start to plot an individual institution's own data. And hopefully that's come up on your screen now. It's just appeared on mine. What this shows is a trend at this particular institution, which, by the way, isn't one of the ones I referenced on the previous slide. Um, but it's a trend which is very starkly in contrast to the sector benchmark. So what we're seeing here is that the proportion of admin and secretarial roles at this university have gone through the roof during the same time period and professional and technical occupations have been on the decline. And that's not at all what you'd expect to see in a world where the onus for some time has been on becoming more efficient and where so many institutions now have been focused on continuous improvement for quite some time. Now, look, there's a caveat here. This is a starting line of inquiry and institutional context is vital. But if I say to you that the university executive in this particular instance weren't aware of this trend and were quite shocked by it, you kind of get a sense of how even with publicly available data, which is quite easy to access, it can start to tell you a bit of a story. And in terms of planning organisation design, you absolutely have to know precisely what you're working with before you move into it. So what SUMS will do for you is not just this kind of analysis from the publicly available data, but we can use the power of our member network to create a really rich set of insight for you that can then become the platform for change. It gives you a platform which people find very hard to contest and actually a rock solid rationale and business case is one of the key success criteria um, for, for taking meaningful change forward. So once that analysis is complete, and I think I've referenced on this slide, you know, this is just one uh, line of inquiry for many. Once it's complete, once it's had rocks thrown at it from every quarter and is as robust as you can get, we can start to plan the actual redesign of your university in a way that addresses the question we started with today. That is, how do you deliver excellence while staying efficient? And I could talk for hours about this, um, but I don't have that time. Um, the bottom line is that universities and the staff who work in them are bundles of capabilities. So purely, for example, if I take um, a capability within a university, so people management, uh, all the activities that support the organisation and contribution of staff at a university. If you break that area of people management down further, there are a ton of sub capabilities as well. So 
workforce planning, um, staff recruitment, um, industrial relations management, and a successful operating model for the future has to identify all of those capabilities across the whole of your university and very clearly set out target states for each of them. Target states informed by the insight I previously mentioned and ideally by really good staff engagement too. And when those target states are accompanied by a detailed transition plan, you more or less have everything in one place that your university needs to get from where it is now to where it wants to go. That journey is hard. Some of the actions within the transition plan will be very, very difficult. Uh, but if you're building it on a platform of great evidence and you engage staff effectively in that process, it really can move you forward very quickly. And that's what some of our universities over last year have been most grateful to receive our support in. Um, the creation of designs or operating models that have efficiency and innovation baked within them. So, as you'd expect, there are a set of lessons which we encourage universities to bear in mind. And that's irrespective of whether they are tackling this agenda themselves or whether they're using any kind of external expertise to help them. And I won't go through all of these bullet by bullet, uh, but I do just want to draw out a couple. So firstly, there is a definite preference in some parts of our sector to jump straight to solutions. These are sometimes solutions which decision makers have observed to work elsewhere and which they're familiar with, or to go back to where I started today, they're solutions which tackle symptoms rather than causes. So for instance, taking costs out without addressing the reason why those costs were being incurred to begin with. And a fundamental building block for successful design and sustainable efficiency is the creation of that rock solid rationale for the changes you plan to make. You cannot know what those changes should be until you've generated the insight. And there is so much data out there which the sector isn't fully harnessing yet, both quant and qual, that can help you in guiding sound decisions. So if you do nothing else today, talk to us about how we can help make all of that data tell you a story. And sticking with the theme, I suppose, there is no version of a successful university 10 years from now where the reams and reams of data you have access to isn't better joined up or being used as a genuinely strategic asset in your decision making. There are so many examples across the sector still of deficits in data governance and by default deficits in data quality. And I don't just mean data which is held on individual spreadsheets out in a particular faculty or school um, and the risks that poses around data protection and other regulatory responsibilities. This is about recognising the game changing developments that are coming down the track. So artificial intelligence, robotic process automation, machine learning, they aren't just buzzwords. They're already here. And they are developments which have potential to be game changers for universities and which are already giving some institutions, often outside the UK, a competitive edge. But fundamentally, if you want to harness the advantages they bring, you have to have a basic platform of sound data governance to begin with and without it, you're building on sand. Uh, what else to pull out before I finish? Um, maybe just one final thought. Uh, if we step into the future and look back from there, the design of any organisation we think now has to consider whether the way in which you've traditionally assessed, recruited, onboarded and managed the performance of your staff is still going to be fit for purpose. Will it be the same environment in 2030 as it is today? Um, we don't think so. Uh, in a world which is as fast paced as this one, as we've all experienced in the last 12 months, how relevant really is a job description, given that it only captures demands of a particular point in time? How sustainable is it for particular jobs to be owned and segmented by individual departments rather than the institution? Tackling this is cultural as much as it is pragmatic, uh, pragmatic um, but really key things, one of uh, hundreds uh, which the sector needs to focus on in the coming years as part of its design work. So uh we're on 23 minutes past 11 i'm going to stop there i hope i've given you a very brief flavor of some of the things you can do either by yourselves institutionally or with support from sums um but let me hand you back to marion to, to kind of sum up uh, and wrap up where we've got to today yeah, great. Thank you so much, David. And thank you to Fola and Joel as well. And I know I can see in the chat to the panelists, to the speakers, that there have been lots of discussions to and fro and people with particular questions and, and wanting to get involved in particular networking groups. So I realize this has been quite a whistle-stop tour through a lot of the areas that SUMS can support universities in. We are happy to take a few questions now, if that would be helpful for anyone, or alternatively, I, I get the sense that people have quite 
meaty things they might like to get into that might warrant a discussion in an email uh, offline. So um, just see if anything pops into the chat. But um, otherwise, it's been really lovely to, to see everyone in the um, attendance today, even though we can't physically see your faces. It's really nice to have you here as a community and we get to know everyone quite well. Um, so very good to meet you and uh, do just give us a shout if there's anything we can help with. Joel, did, was there anything else you wanted to wrap up with? Uh, no, I uh, thank you to everybody for attending today, my colleagues for their presentation. Um, you know, very interested in, in hearing what your challenges are uh, at your universities. If you just want to chat, that's absolutely fine. No, no issues. We're, um, we're a not-for-profit, non-salesy organisation. If you want to just talk through your challenges, we can uh, offer you advice and share with you experiences from other institutions across the sector. But similarly, willing to, uh, to work with you to shape something a bit more concrete, if that's what the support you're looking for. Sounds good. Okay, well, on behalf of the team, then we'll just say thanks again very much. Take good care, have a very safe and healthy weekend, and uh, we'll see you again at something soon. Thanks, everybody.